Thanks, Frank. Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Church of Auckland and to this building. Unitarians built and first occupied December 1901, 117 years ago. We hope you all find something meaningful here with us today. If you are visitors, Please stay for morning tea, an integral part of the service where we can get to know one another a little better. And this morning's talk by my lovely wife, Sharon, um, will be an exercise in our third principle, I do believe. You can check it out while she's talking or before. Um, I just found that out this morning because this is this morning's when she finished writing it and I finally got to read it. For the opening words, um, I'll just say that pre preparation for today's service has um, has been a way of engaging in prayer for me. And I'll try to get through it without being too emotional. Um, but thank you all for participating in my uh, culmination of prayers this morning. And in an attempt to sort of set the mood or set the tone, I chose this responsive reading. I am the earth, the air, and the waters. We have no voice. I will speak for you. I am the redwood, the polar bear, and the great blue whale. We have no voice. I will speak for you. I am the poor, the homeless, and the orphan. I will speak for you. I am the very young, the very old, and the disenfranchised. I will speak for you. I am a minority because of my size, shape, or color, the language I speak, my sexual orientation, or physical ability. I will speak for you. I am alone. Namaste. Namaste. I acknowledge the divine spark within you. Hallow this time together by kindling the lamp of our heritage. On my way into church this morning, um, I get these daily alms, and I thought the one with the message on the one I saw that came through this morning was very appropriate. So I'm sharing. Now, every time I witness a strong person, I want to know, what darkness did you conquer in your story? Mountains do not rise without earthquakes. So, I'm trying to figure out what to tell you, and this first part I've left open-ended. Um, as some of you may know, Dave and I went to Cambodia in 2000 after I graduated from midwifery school and we took our two birth children with us. Um, Adam, at the time we were calling Hannah, we did not know about his trans transgenderness. Um, he was, I think, eight and Sarah was five and a half. And I wanted to provide them with an experience to broaden their perspectives about living in the world in a way similar to I'd experienced as a child living in Tonga. 
My father had been a Peace Corps doctor there, and it was a very uh, wonderful time for me that allowed me to learn about people that ate different food, spoke different languages, lived in different kinds of houses, did many things differently than my um, family and friends in the United States. And I always knew, even before I had children, that I would want to provide a similar experience for my children if I ever had them. And in seeking out a father, Dave was a likely candidate as he lived overseas with his first wife and their children. So off we trekked to Cambodia. And during our time there, Dave and I served um, for consultants to a Quaker project called um, Community Work with Disabled People, CWDP. And um, we had a staff of disabled Cambodian women who worked in the villages to um, provide services, direct care, and link people up with services and things that would improve the quality of their life. And we used to frequent a cafe, guest house, for dinner. Um, the couple that owned it had a little boy, and they were all European. Um, she was a tattoo artist, and they had a guest house that the backpackers liked to stay in. And their little boy, Bastion, had this playmate. Um, and his name was Chiru. At least that's all we knew him as. And he was three and a half when we first met him as Bastion's little playmate. And he was essentially like a little street urchin. Um, and he did have a family. His mother did laundry for backpackers. Um, and tried to feed her family. And her, his dad, I was told, was a stockbroker. And I thought that was interesting. But apparently, that was someone who lives way out um, watching someone else's stock. And he was like a goat herder um, and would come in to visit the family occasionally. So we met this little boy. And then Bastion's parents sold their business and left Kampong Sam and went to Phnom Penh. And so this little boy was almost orphaned by this European family. And um, often after that, when we would come home from work, he would be at our house, because our children had ridden their bikes up, picked him up, and brought him home. And they spent the day playing with Chiru. Um, and his parents didn't seem to mind, and he didn't seem to pay much attention to what his parents wanted him to do or not do. And when he was four, we decided to sponsor him to go to school. And when I went to enroll him into this school to learn English that we figured we would continue to sponsor after we left, they asked me what his name was. And I said, Chiruk. Well, Chiruk means pig. And that was the only name that he knew. And I found out later his mother had given it to him as sort of a uh, nickname because his ears were big, and she said it, they reminded her of a pig. But even though it didn't have as condescending or derogatory a tone as we would think, it did have some. And most of the backpackers, when they learned that his name was Chiruk, would call him pig or piglet. And so when I told them at the school, they were like, Mr. Pig? And I was like, that's not going to work at school, is it? Um, so at that point, I needed a translator to go have a conversation with his mom to see what his real name was. And he was there for the conversation. And that's when he, for the first time, and I heard that his real name was Sok Chan Bibol. And Sok is the family. Chan is like a middle name. And Bibol was his given name, which is a very respectable name. So from then on, when people would call him Chiru, and he was tiny, like very malnourished, little, tiny four-year-old, he would say, You know, this little tiny fella. And that means, no way, my name is Vibol. Like, he didn't want to be called pig anymore. So as time passed, we became very, I and the rest of the family became very attached to Vibol. And 
I'd had to go back to the States for a few months, and we were sending him to school. And um, when I returned, she, his birth mother met me on the street, and had, I had a skirt on that day, and she was on her knees pulling on my skirt on this gravel, pay, you know, gravel road in front of her house saying, and I, by then I could understand enough Khmer that that meant I want to give you my child. And I just kept saying, are they, are they, no way, you know, I can't, I just, in my understanding, I could not take a child away from his birth mother. And I could speak enough Khmer that I said, and he would miss you too much. And she immediately responded that he would miss me more. And in their culture, by then, I understood that that's what they would do. They would give their child to a friend or family member to raise them in hopes of them having more opportunity for a better life. So I thought about it and thought about it and talked with Dave and talked with Dave and talked with our other children. And although I wanted to, my brain said it's wrong. And eventually we decided to see if we could do it. And I think at that time we thought of it as like a foster child arrangement, or at least I did, that we would raise him and he would never cut the strings to his birth family, but he would have two mothers, and as his birth mother put it, she would always be the mother who birthed him, and I could be the mother who raised him. And with his birth parents' help, um, going to all the government officials that we needed to go to and pay the bribes to, to get a birth certificate and to get paperwork done, even the court, you know, the paperwork said we paid 7,000 reals, to the judge, which is the equivalent of $1.75 US. I think we paid $500 or I don't, $250 to the judge as a bribe to get him to sign the paperwork. And on Thanksgiving, we found out um, that we legally were going to be able to take Vibol with us. Um, and we didn't know at that point if we were coming back or we we're going to go back to the States or come to New Zealand. We were you know, figuring it out, but at that point, we couldn't have gotten Will with us into the United States, and um, it looked like New Zealand was a much better option for where I could work in a way I wanted to as a midwife. So we um, came to New Zealand. Will was just six before we landed in New Zealand, and um, his first year of school, he started as a six-year-old. And ab he, I remember the first day of school, he came home and said, that school is great. And I'd had to tell his teacher before to, to be aware. Um, he had gone to, to a Cambodian school a little bit. And I said, now I've told him when he has to go to the toilet, he needs to go into the toilet and pee and poo on a toilet or in the toilet. But just so you know, at the school he went to in Cambodia, they didn't have toilets. So if he accidentally gets caught peeing out on the playground or in the bushes around the school or pooing, just remind him. He won't mean to be a bad kid. That, and she, her eyes were like, <laughs> you know? So he fitted in beautifully. And um, I've written a poem that I gave to him a few months ago, and he's not discussed with me. I don't even know for sure if he read it, but we've been struggling. Um, he just turned 22 on December 30th, and um, instead of giving, well, no, I gave him a birthday present called Freedom. I cut off his phone that I'd been paying for because I'd had enough. Um, so this is the poem, and it's essentially the bulk of my service for today. It's called, When the Truth Becomes Your Enemy. Struggling with the idea, my head said no, but my heart said yes. How could I take you away from the woman who birthed you? But I wanted you, and she begged. I wondered why. 
Did she want something from me then or now or from you? What was her expectation? How could a woman who had birthed a child want to give that child to another woman? I couldn't conceive. Was it right? My head said no, but my heart said yes. You were a gift from your birth mother to me, to us. Not my child by birth, but a gift from your mother, your other mother, your birth mother, your father, your other father, your birth father, a gift to me, to us from the universe. Was it right to take you? My head said no, but my heart said yes. I watched you grow. I watched you play. I watched you fall and get back up. And sometimes I watched you have tantrums. I watched you struggle. I could see it in your eyes. As if possessed by some other being, a presence inside of you, not knowing what to do, how to do, how to be, I watched you become a man. I watched you love your life and love your friends. And then, what happened? I sometimes couldn't recognize you. Your struggle was real, very big, and very real. You wanted to belong, to be and stay connected, to feel validated, I suppose. When people asked you where you were from, you didn't even know what country to say. I'm Cambodian, raised by an American family in New Zealand. When you were little, you said you wanted a t-shirt that said, yes, I'm adopted. When we adopted you at five years old, you asked if you were going to get to drink my milk. You knew that's what children did. They drank milk from their mothers. You were sad when I told you there was no more milk, that Adam and Sarah had drunk all the milk. Your birth siblings called me your Ma'barang, your white mother. As you grew older, you were desperate to keep up your appearances of being cool and looking stylish, desperate for all the things you thought success looked like, desperate, desperate. Your struggle became more and more evident. You made self-destructive choices to keep up your image of success. The chasm grew and became enormous. You told me everyone had such high expectations of you, me and dad, your birth family. Now I wonder who really had the expectations. Was it us or was it you? I wondered if taking you had been a mistake. My head said yes, but my heart said no. I took you because I loved you. And love is an action, a commitment. And true love is not conditional or temporary. When you love someone who is struggling, how do you not feel their torment? When you see their floundering, their struggle, their pain, when your beloved son is self-destructively flopping around on the ground like a fish out of water, when his steps lead to danger, distaste, distrust, and disgust, when he steps, when his steps are unsteady and his distress and pain real. 
when his words have become empty and his actions have become destru- destructive, when he, his eyes look tormented and his body is twitching. He is edgy and sometimes he says he has to leave because he is afraid he wants to hurt me. But he doesn't want to hurt his mother, so he does leave. How do I not feel your torment? My son has become haunted by ghosts, but no longer the ghosts of his childhood. His childhood ghosts were hidden in every corner, but he had strategies to cope because they were not real. He could put towels over the ones that were hidden in the lino on the bathroom floor to make them disappear so he could safely go in and pee at night. But the ghosts of today, no, those ghosts are real. They are his very own, self-made ghosts. He has two ghosts, and both of them torment him. He cannot put towels over them and make them disappear like the ones of his childhood on the bathroom floor. These ghosts now are his, and these ghosts now are real. Ghost one aims to impress. It aims to look good, to aim to be the object of envy. It has taken 10,000 selfies and hundreds of pictures of beautifully prepared restaurant meals. This ghost, like a balloon, being perpetually inflated, continuously expanding, and with more and more and more forced air, is full of nothing and exists in extreme tension, with an ever-increasing and inevitable risk of explosion, exposure, a bursting that will eventually end in a bloody fucking mess. When the truth becomes your enemy, in an illusion, an illusion of reality, Ghost One is an illusion of reality. An illusion that is trying to comfort the unmet needs of the other ghost. Ghost number two, the ghost of despair, the ghost of suffering, the ghost of shame, the ghost that is afraid it is never good enough the ghost that is trying to survive with unbearable pain. As each ghost grows, the other grows too. Feeding each other, they coexist, hand in hand. They each exist because of the other. Do you even know who you are, son? I took you because I had started to love you, I wanted to love you, and I found joy in loving you. I have done things for you I'd never dreamed of doing for anyone else. Things like taking you from your birth mother, your birth family, like skydiving on my 50th and jumping off the sky tower for your 21st, like getting a tattoo that you drew for me to put on my mastectomy site. And the things I've done for you that I'd never dreamed of now, including making police reports and kicking you out of our house. That is because love is an action. I took you so I could love you forever, not just a short time, but forever. Love, you say, what is that? I'm discovering as I go. 
and a journey it has been. A journey full of twists and a journey that has stretched me way beyond my comfort zone. A journey that has had struggles and a journey that has had pain. But most of all, a journey that has been full of growth and celebration and love. A journey that has always, at its core, at its essence, had love. Unconditional and eternal love from me for you and for that journey, I will be eternally grateful. I took you from your birth family, and was it a mistake? My mind says maybe, but my heart says no. And this is according to Edelman in the Tao of Negotiation. This is um, a, some quotes I used in a paper when I was studying midwifery, a leadership course. Honesty involves honoring your own inner truth, accepting your own feelings, being willing to be vulnerable. Honesty is a risk. It holds out for a deeper truth, we may alienate or lose those in our lives who prefer to live in denial. Whatever the result, without honesty, there is never the possibility for genuine communication to transpire. It is only when we are willing to venture into the initial, initially terrifying territory of honesty that disputes can either be solved or prevented altogether. Truth is that which does not contaminate you, but empowers you. We need truth to grow in the same way that we need vitamins, affection, and love. Amen. So we have a short meditation. No? Um, I've just got some closing words, but I thought I'd tell you that the last trip we made back to Cambodia, because we've been back twice with Will, once when he was 12 and then again when he was 18, and this last time Dave had to come back um, for a play he was in, but Will and I stayed on and did a scuba diving course together and took his birth family for a road trip for about a week from where they live up to see the temples and um, had a really wonderful time with them staying at places where there were swimming pools so we could all play together and really spend some lovely time um, <laughs> communing as a, an extended family. And um, this shirt his mom gave me at one of the waterfalls that we went to on that visit. So it's pretty special. So the closing words I have are um, from the 
Stephen Covey writing Principle-Centered Leadership. From the cowardice that is afraid of new truth, from the laziness that is content with half-truth, from the arrogance that assumes it has all truth, O oh God of truth, deliver us. Thank you.